Praise the Lord. I welcome you to the Bible study tonight in Jesus' name. And I pray that it will be an enriching Bible study for everyone. The blessing of God will be upon your life. It will look like you have never attended Bible study before. Something great will happen to you. Let's pray together. Father, in the name of Jesus. We thank you for our Bible study tonight. We bless your name because you brought your people here to bless us. We pray that in the study of the word tonight, there will be great blessing and revelation for everyone in Jesus' name. We pray, Lord, that you lift your people higher and let us grow in the things of the Lord in Jesus' name. Let your blessing rest and abide on the study of the word tonight. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. We continue our study in the epistle of John, the first epistle. And we're looking at chapter 2, verses 12, 13, and 14. First John, chapter 2, verse 12. I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you, young men, because ye have overcome the wicked one. I write unto you, little children. Because ye have known the Father. Verse 14, I have written unto you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong, and the word of God abideth in you. And ye have overcome the wicked one. As you look at those verses of scripture, you will see that John is still talking about the Christian life. He has already told us about the marks of the children of God. The marks and the characteristics you see and you observe in the family of God. Now he wants to tell us that we are different stages of growing because we have the life of Christ and the life of the spirit within us. Because of that, we grow. Anything that has life grows. In a natural family, when children are born, they go from infancy to adolescence to adulthood until they become totally mature. And the same thing we find in the Word of God. It's telling us here that those who are in the family of God, children of God, were first of all little children, babes in Christ, infants in the Lord. And then we grow to young men, and then we grow to fathers in the Lord. Although he's using young men and fathers, he actually refers to the whole body of Christ. He's talking about the men and the women, the brothers and the sisters. And he's telling us, we start by being born in the family. That's why he tells us in verse 12, he says, I write unto you little children. That's not the first time he's going to mention little children. Look at chapter 2 verse 1. It says, my little children, these things write I unto you, that ye see not. Also, he tells us, and if any man sin, you see, he's talking about the church. He's talking about the members. He's talking about those who are babes in Christ. He's talking about little children. And he says, there are marks. There are characteristics. There are things we notice in the life of an individual. And you will know that this is a child of God. That is sin not. Then he said, and if any man sin, we have an advocate for the Father, Jesus Christ, the righteous. This imagery or this illustration of growth is not peculiar to First John. You're going to find throughout the Bible that as we come to know the Lord, we come from being babes in Christ and then we continue to grow. Look at First Peter chapter 2. 
In First Peter chapter 2, reading here from verse 1, it tells us about the child of God, about the one that is born again. It tells us, wherefore laying aside all malice and all guile and all hypocrisies and envies and all evil speaking. Look at this now, verse 2, as newborn babes. As little children desire the sincere milk of the world that she may grow thereby. And so then he expects that you as you are born into the kingdom, as you come into the kingdom, that you will grow from infancy to adulthood. It tells us in Second Corinthians chapter 3, still telling us that we grow. As we behold the face of the Lord, as we partake of more grace from the Lord, we keep on growing. In 2 Corinthians chapter 3, reading here from verse 18. 2 Corinthians chapter 3, and we're reading from verse 18. It says in verse 18, but we all, referring to the children, to the young men, to the fathers, to the mothers, to everyone. It says and we all, with open face, beholding. As in a glass, the glory of the Lord are changed into the same image from glory to glory. That he is from one level of glory to another level of glory. From one level of glory to a higher level of glory. And then he says, even as by the Spirit of the Lord. is expecting that will move. Is expecting that will increase. Is expecting that will grow. Is expecting that will not stay at the same level all the time. That we're looking at the Lord and we're beholding the grace of God. We're beholding the glory of God and we're moving from one level of attainment to another. From faith to faith. From glory to glory. From strength to strength. And from one level of understanding to a higher level of understanding. And that's what John is emphasizing today. He says, little children, I'm writing to you. He says, young men, I'm writing to you. And he says, fathers, I'm writing to you. It's not making us to doubt our salvation. It's making us to understand that even if we're little children, we have the life of the Spirit and the life of God in us. But we must not remain at that initial stage, at that level. We must move on. We must grow. We're told in Job chapter 17. Job chapter 17 is still talking about how you grow. And then as we look at all these verses of scripture, you'll be asking yourself, am I growing in the Lord? I've known the Lord. I'm born again. I'm a child of God. Is there growth taking place in my life? We're looking at Job chapter Job chapter 17 and we're looking at verse 9. It says, the righteous also shall hold on his way and he that has clean hands shall be stronger and stronger. That gives you the idea of growth all the same. You see, you're, you're strong. It says, young men, I'm writing unto you because you're strong and because the word of God abides in you. And here Job tells us that although we are strong, you can become stronger and you are going to become stronger. Because it says, we hold on on our ways and then we'll become stronger and stronger. We're looking at Proverbs chapter 4. I'm reading verse 18. Proverbs chapter 4, and we're reading it from verse 18, emphasizing the fact that when you come to know the Lord, you're not stagnant. You're not remaining at the same level all through your Christian life. You are growing. You are moving forward. You are moving up. And it tells us in Proverbs chapter 4, verse 18, in verse 18 it says, but the path of the just, those who are justified, those who are born again, they are passed from condemnation unto justification. Their sins are forgiven and they have the life of God in them and the spirit of the Lord walking in them. And it tells us now the path of the just is as the shining light that shines more and more unto the perfect day. It's shining more and more. I pray your light will shine and you'll move on to higher ground in Jesus' name. 
Psalm 84. In Psalm 84, it's telling us that all the parts of the Bible expects that when you come as a child to the kingdom of God, when you are born into the family of God, when the life of Christ begins in you, there must be growth. You cannot remain at the same level all the time. You will not remain at the same level. You're moving forward. You're moving higher. You're growing up in the Lord. In Psalm 84, here reading from verse 7. Psalm 84, reading from verse 7, it says, They go from strength to strength. Every one of them in Zion appeareth before God. That is, you appear before the Lord. He gives you more grace. You appear before the Lord. He gives you more strength. You appear before the Lord and your faith increases. Your strength increases. Your understanding increases. The more you study the word of God, you come day after day and week after week and you are studying the word of God, believing the word of God, applying the word of God to yourself, meditating upon the word of God. It says this will be the, the result. As you appear before the Lord, you'll be going from one level of strength to another level of of strength. We're reading now from the New Testament. We're looking at uh, Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3. Here Paul the apostle gives his own testimony and he gives his own understanding of how he's pursuing this growth and moving on in the things of the Lord so that he will know the Lord more. He knew the Lord already but then he said I want to know him more. In Philippians chapter 3 we're looking at verse 13. Philippians chapter 3 and we're reading from verse 13. It says, Brethren, I count not myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, forgetting those things which are behind and reaching forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark of the price of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. Very clear, isn't it? That uh, no matter what level you are now, no matter what grace you have now, you are going to grow. And you are going to grow up. And the Lord is telling us, it's not just growing old, it is growing up. It is not just being saved, it is moving on to be sanctified. It is not just being saved and sanctified, it is moving on so that you'll be filled and baptized in the Holy Ghost. And it is not just having that initial power. When the Holy Ghost comes upon you, you're moving on. You're not resting. You're not relaxing. You're not looking back. You're saying, I can have more. I can get more. I can go further. And you're going to have more and grow further in Jesus' name. And so, as you look at all these verses of Scripture, it is saying to, for you to ask yourself, am I growing? Am I making progress? Am I achieving more today than I did last year? Than I did when I first came to know the Lord? He said, you must not be an infant all your life. We're happy when children are born into the family. And then with all the characteristics of the children, we see the life in them, the excitement, the wonder of young people, the wonder of the infant child. But you become, you get concerned when that baby remains a baby. At 10, at 20, at 40, it's still childish. Then you become concerned. And so he's telling us the same thing spiritually that the wonder of childhood must move on to the warfare of young men. And they must move on to the wisdom of the fathers. Let's come back now to First John. We're looking at First John chapter 2. And it tells us about the wonder of childhood. And then the warfare of adulthood and then the wisdom of the aged. We're looking at uh, First John chapter 2. In verse 12 I read again, it says, Arise unto you little children because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. It says this assurance you can have. That you understand your sins are forgiven. These assurance you can have, you belong to the family. You are born again. You are born anew. You are born from above. And a change has happened unto you. The guilt in your conscience is taken away. The condemnation is taken away. It says, I'm writing to you little children because you have this assurance. You are born of God and your sins are forgiven. It tells us in verse 13, I write unto you, fathers, because ye have known him. 
that is from the beginning. He said, you are settled in your conviction. You cannot be confused anymore. Nobody can toss you to and fro because of settled conviction, settled understanding, and the settled knowledge of the things of God, fathers, elderly people, aged people, in the things of the Lord. I'm writing to you because you have known him. That is from the beginning. Verse 13, it says, I write unto you, young men. These are people that have left the infancy of the Christian life the babyhood of the christian life and the childhood of the christian life and they're growing up and he says all right to young men because ye have overcome the wicked one you'll overcome no matter what direction that wicked one comes from it says that when you are growing in the lord and the strength of the world is visible in your life it says this is the one mark we're going to notice in your life that you overcome you overcome the wicked one are you understand how you're going to overcome it says all right unto you little children once again because ye have known the father in verse 14 i have written unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. In verse 14 again. And I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. You will be strong. Somebody there said you will be strong. And the word of God abideth in you. And once again it says, and ye have overcome the wicked one. We're looking at this message, the stages of spiritual growth in God's family. The stages of spiritual growth in God's family. We're looking at point number one. Point number one, the precious privilege of children, the children of the father. The precious privilege of the children of the father. Number two is the prevailing power of young men in the family. The prevailing power of young men in the family, in God's family. Number three, the priceless perception of fathers in the faith. The priceless perception of fathers in the faith. Let's come to number one, the precious privilege of the children of the father. We're coming back to First John verse chapter two verse twelve. First John chapter two verse twelve. It says, "I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for His name's sake." Think about that. It says, "Little children, I'm writing to you. I want to confirm to you that your sins are forgiven." You see, when you are born again, sometimes Satan will bring doubt, bring, bring confusion to you, and will be asking, are you sure you are born again? Are you sure you are a child of God? Are you sure? Do you understand this? Do you understand that? And because of the ignorance of babes in Christ, because of the limitation of the knowledge of infants in the Lord, and because of the limited experience and exposure of those little children in the Lord, a doubt may come. And so John says, let there be no doubt in your heart. That's why I'm writing to, to give you the assurance that if you're a child of God, even though you're a baby in Christ, you will know that your sins are forgiven. How are your sins forgiven? Not because of what you have done. Not because you cried and cried and cried for salvation. And it is not because you, are, you become an angel overnight. He says he has forgiven you because of his glory. For his name's sake. And then he tells us, look at verse, uh, look at verse 13 there. In verse 13, after he has said, I've written to you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you because, young men, because you have overcome the wicked one. He now says, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the father. Two things about them. Number one, their sins were forgiven, the little children. Number two, they have known the father. Think about that for a moment. Somebody is born again. You are born again. You are a child of God. 
and the spirit of God is bearing witness in your heart, you are born again. You are a child of God. Your sins are forgiven. You are passed from condemnation. You have come unto life and you are justified and there is peace in your heart now. What do we learn about that? First of all, let us see what John is saying to the little children. Look at chapter 3 verse 7. Chapter 3, verse 7, little children, let no man deceive you. You see, little children could easily be deceived. And that is why you hear about child molestation. That is why you hear about kidnapping of these little children. That is why you hear about the torment and the evil things that, uh, you know, all the people do to little children because they are weak. And because they are ignorant, they could easily be enticed by sweet or by anything. That's why parents will tell them, will tell the little children, don't talk to strangers. Don't answer those strangers. Don't take anything from any stranger. Why? Because little children can easily be deceived. The same thing spiritually. You can easily be tossed to and fro. That's why John was concerned about these little children. But seven little children, let no man deceive you. He that doeth righteousness is righteous, even as he is righteous. Look at verse 10. In verse 10, in this the children of God are manifest, and the children of the devil. Whosoever doeth not righteousness is not of God, neither he that loveth not his brother. John wanted the people to know the characteristics and the marks. What you are going to see when you look at a baby in Christ, when you look at a child of God, it says, let nobody deceive you. You are going to see the mark of this initial victory. Victory over the evil one and victory over sin. And then you are able to live in righteousness of life. Look at chapter 4 verse 4. You have got little children. It says, even though you are a little child, even though you are a baby in Christ, even though you are not totally matured yet, even though there is ignorance in your life, even though there is uh, immaturity demonstrated in your life, because of your limited experience, all the same, ye yeah, of God, little children, and have overcome them, because greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world. He wanted to assure those little children, babes in Christ, that they should have assurance, assurance of their relationship with God, assurance of their walk with the Lord. He tells us in chapter 5, verse 2, chapter 5, verse 2, by this, we know that we love the children of God when we love God and keep his commandments. Look at this in verse 3. For this is the love of God that we keep his commandments and his commandments are not grievous. He tells us in verse 2 we're children of God because we love God. There is that affection. There is that attraction to the, to the Father and to God the Heavenly Father in the little child. Uh, let's come back to that chapter 2 now verse 12 uh, and look at it uh, in a analytical manner. It says, I write unto you, little children, because your sins are forgiven you for his name's sake. Understand that you have been born again. John, the beloved, and the Holy Ghost wants you to have this assurance. Your sins are forgiven you. Look at the latter part of verse 13. It says, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known the Father. Number one, as we talk about these little children, as we talk about these babes in Christ, as we talk about these people who have just come into the kingdom, even though they are not, they have not grown to adulthood yet, even at the initial stage of the Christian life, what do we learn about them? Number one, the assurance of forgiveness. The assurance of forgiveness. You find somebody who has just come to know the Lord. John wants us to encourage them and to tell them, be assured of your forgiveness. The assurance of forgiveness. Number two is the apparel after forgiveness. The apparel, the clothing that God gives them spiritually. After that, forgiveness. The apparel after forgiveness. Number three, the adoption into the family. Adoption into the family. When a child is born, the child is not thrown to the street. And the child is not left at the maternity. The child, those who are born again, they are not left at the crusade field. We bring them in. They are adopted into the family. 
family. Number four, abiding in the family. Abiding in, in the family. A child is born. And therefore, he abides in the family. And the family is able to take care of that child. Somebody is born again. It's a new babe in Christ. Somebody is born again. It's a little child in Christ. Somebody is born again. It's an infant in the Lord. Abiding in the family. Number five, affection from the father. Affection from the father. Of course, the mother as well. But it's the image and the language of the father that the apostle is using here. The little children and the young men and the fathers. And you have affection from the father or from the family. Number six, there is um, attachment to the family. Attachment to the family. And then a child knows who the mother is, who the father is, and can recognize them. Those are the first people that recognize this when he comes into this world and he has attachment to the family and when people are born again they are born into the kingdom these are the marks and these are the characteristics we are going to see in their spiritual lives very quickly one by one assurance of forgiveness assurance of forgiveness we're looking at ephesians chapter one Ephesians chapter 1, and we're looking at verse 7. Ephesians chapter 1, verse 7. It says, in whom we have redemption. You see that? We don't have that redemption in ourselves. In whom we have redemption. The moment you come to Christ, it says, whosoever cometh unto me, I will in no wise cast out. Lord Jesus, I come. And then Jesus says, I receive you. I accept you. I forgive you. It says, you know, we have redemption through his blood. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. The forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. And it is the spirit that gives us assurance that he is ours and will belong to him. Number two is the apparel after that forgiveness. The, apparel, the clothing after the forgiveness. You're looking at Isaiah chapter 61. You have come to know the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, you have assurance of your forgiveness. Number two, there's a kind of garment you wear spiritually. There's a kind of clothing you have spiritually. The apparel for the forgiven. We're looking at Isaiah chapter 61. And we're looking at verse 10. It says, I will greatly rejoice in the Lord. My soul shall be joyful in my God. For he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. And he has covered me with the robe of righteousness. He has covered me with the robe of righteousness. And he has clothed me with the garment of salvation. How did that happen? And when did that happen? We're told in Romans chapter 10. Salvation and righteousness. Salvation and righteousness. The garment, the clothing, the apparel, the covering for that new babe in Christ. And when God gives you that at the point of conversion, he never takes that away from you while you still abide and remain in the Lord. In Romans chapter 10 verse 9 it says that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shall believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead thou shalt be saved it says that there's no doubt about that and there's no beating about the bush about that can I be saved can I be born again can I be a member of the family of God if you come to the Lord there's no rejection and there's no exception and there's no partiality and then you confess with your mouth that Jesus is your Lord and you believe in your heart that he was raised from the dead on your behalf. Look at what happens now. The clothing, the apparel, the garment. It says in verse 10, for the mouth, for the heart, man believes unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. Salvation and righteousness. The robe, the garment, the apparel after you are forgiven. Number three is the adoption into the family. As you are born again, you are not just an isolated believer. You are integrated into the body of Christ. A born again child of God, a new convert, a little child, 
a new baby in Christ, the one who has just been converted by the power of the blood of the Lamb, cleansing him, he becomes a part of the family. Because now you are adopted into the spiritual family of God. Look at Romans chapter 8. Romans chapter 8, we're reading from verse 15. Romans chapter 8, reading from verse 15. Adoption into the family. It tells us, for ye have not received the spirit of bondage again to fear, but ye have received the spirit of adoption, whereby we cry, Abba, Father. It says, you are not part of the family of God. There are young men there, there are fathers there, there are little children there too, and will belong to the family. And it says, because you belong to the family, all the privileges of the family, they are yours. And all the provisions for the family are yours. All the inheritance for the family, everything belongs to you. Look at verse 16. The spirit itself beareth witness with our heart, with our spirit, that we are the children of God. Our sins are forgiven. No more condemnation. We have confessed our sins. We have forsaken our sins. And we believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be our Savior. He tells us here assuredly. He says the Spirit now bears witness with our spirit. That we are the children of God. Look at verse 17. And if children, children of God. And if children born into the family. And if children little babes in Christ. And if children then heirs, heirs of God. And joint heirs with Christ, if so be that we suffer with him, that we may also be glorified together. I pray that this assurance will be in every one of our hearts in Jesus' name. Number one is the assurance of forgiveness. Number two is the apparel for the forgiven. Number three is adoption into the family. Number four, abiding in the family. Your abode is now in the family. Your shelter is now in the family. Your desire is towards the family. You want to stay. You want to abide. If you're truly born again, it will not be that, you know, we're running after you and then you say, well, I don't know whether I want to come or not. Are you born again? Don't you have the desire to be integrated into the family of God? You want to abide in the family. Little children, New converts, those who have just given their lives to the Lord, you want to abide. It tells us in First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 28. First John chapter 2, and we're reading from verse 28, telling us of uh, the nature of that little baby in Christ, of that little child in Christ. It tells us in First John chapter 2, verse 28, and now little children abide in him. And our little children abide in him. Abide in the grace of God. Abide in the family of God. Abide in the fold. Abide with the one who has saved you. He says that now little children abide in him that when he shall appear, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. You will not be ashamed. Number five is affection from the father, affection from the family. You love him because he first loved you. And you want to demonstrate that love by where your affection is. Colossians chapter 3. Colossians chapter 3. We're reading from verses 1 and 2. Talking about those who have come to know the Lord. And those who rejoice in their newfound experience in the Lord. Little children, you are abiding in him. Little children, you are loved by the Lord. And you love the Lord as well. Colossians chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 1. It says in verse 1, If ye then be risen with Christ... Seek those things which are above, where Christ seated on the right hand of God. And set your affections on things on high. And set your affections on things above and not on things on the earth. It tells us, well then, that when you are born again, little children, you have assurance of forgiveness. 
Little children, you have the apparel for the forgiven. Little children, you have adoption into the family. Little children, you are abiding in the family. Little children, you have affection from the father and for the family. And then now you have attachment to the family. Attachment to the family. Show me somebody who is born again. He wants to be with the people of God. Show me somebody who sins have been forgiven. He doesn't want to be running around with those sinners in the world anymore. He wants to be among the people that have the same like precious faith. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Acts of the Apostles chapter 2. Here we're reading from verse 41. It says, And they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look at what follows here. And they continued. That's it. And they continued. Little children, new converts, baby, babes in Christ. And they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine. And then it says, and in fellowship, and in breaking of bread, and in prayers. Verse 47, praising God and having favor with all the people. And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. Thank God for being born again. And as you are born again, and you have given your life totally to the Lord, these are the marks we'll see in your life. There'll be the desire for the people of God. There'll be the desire for the house of God. There'll be the desire sharing with the people of God. We're coming back to First John chapter 2. First John chapter 2. And here now we're going to the next stage of development. First John chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 13. It says, I write unto you fathers because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you young men. Because ye have overcome the wicked one. I have written, I write unto you, little children, because ye have known him, that ye have known the Father. Look at that verse 13. I write unto you, young men. These are no more little babes anymore, little children anymore. Growth has taken place. Like growth is going to take place in your life. And we will grow in Jesus' name. And then he tells us that young men, as you grow from little children to young men, he says, you have overcome the wicked one. Underline that word, overcome, overcome. Then you become an overcomer. Look at verse 14. I've written to you, fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I have written unto you, young men, because ye are strong. And the word of God abideth in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. You see what he's telling us about the young men, about those who are now growing to adolescence in the Christian life. And they grow into adulthood in the Christian life. It says this you know about them. Number one, the word of God abides in them. They read the word. They study the word. They apply the word to their lives. They meditate on the word. And that word of God abides in them. It, they're not like people that hear in one ear and it goes out the other ear. They're not the people that hear and they're forgetful of what they have heard. They are people that apply the word of God to themselves. And they say, I want to grow. I want to make progress. I want to grow in faith. I want to grow in love. I want to grow in grace. I want to grow in godliness. I want to grow in my resistance against the devil. And I want to be an overcomer. And because of that, this word abides in them. This word remains in them. And this word stays in them. And the word is producing fruit in their lives. It's producing the joy. And it's producing the strength. And it's producing the conviction. And it's producing courage in them. Because it's the word that makes us to grow. Well, it's good to pray. But when we pray, we pray according to that word. It's good to say, yes, Lord, I believe. But we believe that word. It is the word that is central to all the things that make us to grow. And this word abiding in you, you will grow in Jesus' name. And there you become an overcomer. It says, number one, the word abides in them. Number two, they are strong. 
they go from strength to strength. And the sin that will make them fall many years ago today will not make them fall because they are strong by the strength of the abiding word. And then the finality of the age is such they have overcome the wicked one. Overcome the wicked one. Pick up that. And let us see what do we know about the wicked one that they overcome. As you look through your New Testament in particular, you'll find, number one, the titles of the wicked one. The titles of the wicked one. Number two, you will find the temptations of the wicked one. Temptations of the wicked one. Number three, you'll find the terror of the wicked one. The terror of the wicked one. And here John is telling us that because the word abides in you, and that's what makes you strong, and that's what makes you an overcomer. Number one, you overpower the titles of the wicked one. Overpower. The titles of the wicked one. Number two, you overcome the temptations of the wicked one. The temptations may come. Trials may come. The tests may come from every direction. And it says, if the word is abiding in you, and thank God the word is abiding in you, you'll be an overcomer. You'll not be afraid. You'll overcome in Jesus' name. Number two is overcoming the temptations of the wicked one. Number three, over, overruling, overruling the terror of the wicked one. I see conquerors there today. I said I see overcomers there today. Look at this. We overpower the titles of the wicked one. Let's first identify who is referring to as the wicked one. We're looking at Matthew chapter 3. Matthew, we're looking at uh, chapter 13. Matthew chapter 13, and I'm reading here from verse 19. Matthew chapter 13, and we're looking at verse 19. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 19. It says, when anyone hears the word of the kingdom, then it says, and understandeth it not, then cometh who now? Tell me out loud. The wicked one. Then comes the wicked one. Here is the parable of the sower of the seed. And Jesus said, The seed that falls by the wayside is like the one that hears the word and he doesn't understand. And the wicked one cometh and he taketh away that word that was sowed in his heart. This is he which receiveth the seed by the wayside. I want you to notice that he calls him here the wicked one. But look at Mark chapter 4. Mark chapter 4. The same parable. The same parable. And now Mark chapter 4, we're looking at verse 15. Mark chapter 4 verse 15. It says, And these are they by the wayside, where the word is sown. But when they have heard Satan cometh immediately and taketh away the word that was sown in their hearts. Mark calls him Satan and Matthew calls him the wicked one. What do we learn from that? The wicked one is Satan. And yet it says we who are young men in the Lord, the word of God abiding in us and that makes us strong we overcome Satan we overcome the wicked one. Somebody there is an overcomer. And you will overcome that Satan in Jesus' name. Look at this, Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12, the wicked one. Revelation chapter 12, we're reading from verse 10. Revelation chapter 12, verse 10. It says, and I heard a loud voice saying in heaven now is salvation and strength and uh, the kingdom of our god and the power of christ for the accuser of the brethren is cast down which accused them before our god day and night accuser of the brethren is called now an accuser he is satan 
is the wicked one and he is accuser. But what happens? Does he overcome us? No, look at verse 11. And they overcame him by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of their testimony. And they loved not their lives even unto the death. Call him Satan, we overcome. Call him the wicked one, we overcome. Call him the accuser, we overcome every time. Am I talking to somebody there? You are going to overcome in Jesus' name. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5. First Peter chapter 5. And here I'm reading from verse 8. We're looking at the titles of the wicked one. And whatever the title of the wicked one may be, the word of God abides in you. That makes you strong. That makes you an overcomer. We're looking at First Peter chapter 5. And we're reading from verse 8. Be sober and be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil. Now, another title is the adversary, the devil. Adversary. As a running lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour. Is he going to overcome us? Or are we going to overcome him? Look at verse 9. Whom receives steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. It says, resist him, he will flee from you. Are you there? I said, he will flee from you. <laughs> Call him the wicked one, we overcome. Call him the accuser, we overcome. Call him Satan, we overcome. Call him the adversary, we overcome. James chapter 4. In James chapter 4, here we're reading from verse 7. James chapter 4, we're reading from verse 7. Reading from verse 7, here is what is telling us in chapter 4 verse 7. It says, submit yourselves therefore to God. Receive the devil. There's another name for him, is the devil. Receive the devil and he will flee from you. Give me a good amen. amen. That means we're overcomers. Did you know that? That I write unto you, young men, because you are strong, and because the word of God abides in you, and ye have overcome the wicked one. He is Satan, ye have, ye have overcome. He is the devil, ye have overcome. He is accuser of the brethren, ye have overcome. And he is the adversary, thank God I have overcome. Now he is called the God of this world. We're looking at 2 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 4. Here I am reading from verse 4. 2 Corinthians chapter 4 verse 4. In whom the God of this world. This is another title for this wicked one. For that wicked one. In whom the God of this world has blinded the minds of them. Which believe not. Thank God I believe. Thank God I believe. Because he has blinded the minds of those that believe not. Lest the light of the glorious gospel of Christ. Who is the image of God shall shine unto them. What happens to us? Look at verse 6. For God who commanded the light to shine. Out of darkness has shined in our hearts. To give the light of the knowledge of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. That means we're still overcome. I'm telling you that if the word of God abides in you, you are going to be strong. And you are going to overcome. And this week that we're coming to, this new week, greater victory is coming your way. And all those terrible things that the devil may try to do, thank God I see an overcomer there today. We're looking at Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. I'm reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 10. And we're reading from verse 17. Luke chapter 10. And we read from verse 17. In verse 17. And the 17 returned again with joy. Saying, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. Even the devils are subject unto us through thy name. And he said unto them, I beheld Satan as lightning fall from heaven. And behold, here is something waiting for you. 
And behold, I give unto you power to tread on serpents and on scorpions and over all the power of the enemy and nothing shall by any means hurt you. Can you overcome? I say, can you overcome? Yes. You have overcome already. Yes. And he is the ruler of the darkness of this world. The ruler of the darkness of this world. But whatever the title, they're just title, we are the overcomers. Yes. Ephesians chapter 6. Ephesians chapter 6. I'm reading from verse 12. It says in verse 12, for we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities and powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. What happens because of all these terrible names here? Look at what happens in verse 13. Wherefore, take unto you the whole armor of God, that she may be able to withstand in the evil day. And having done all to fall, to cringe, to be afraid, to be terrified, to stand, somebody there will stand. Yeah. Having done all to stand, stand therefore. Having your loins got about with truth. Have been on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith ye shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked. You have overcome already. Number one is overpowering the titles of the wicked one. Number two is overcoming. The temptations of the wicked one. Overcoming the temptations of the wicked one. Temptations will come. But there's no fear. Even before those temptations come, a way for you to overcome has now been made available. In Christ Jesus, you'll overcome. By the blood of the Lamb, you'll overcome. By the abiding word inside you, you will overcome. And by the strength and the power of the Holy Ghost inside you, you'll overcome in Jesus' name. First Corinthians chapter 10. First Corinthians chapter 10. I'm reading here from verse 13. First Corinthians chapter 10, verse 13. There has no temptation taken you, but such as is common to men or to man. But God is faithful. He will not fail you. God is faithful. Who will not suffer you, allow you, permit you to be tempted above that you are able, but will with the temptation also make a way to escape that she may be able to bear it. You'll escape and you are going to overcome in Jesus' name. The word of God makes us strong. Strong enough to overcome temptations. And as Jesus overcame by the word of the Lord, when he told the devil, it is written. The devil came again and Jesus said, it is written. He came again and Jesus said, it is written. He overcame, we will overcome. By the word, you will overcome. By prayer, you will overcome. By the power of the spirit, you will overcome. Number one, overpowering the titles of the wicked one. Number two, overcoming the temptations of the wicked one. Number three, overruling the terror of the wicked one. Satan does not have the last say in your life. You have the final say. If you say right there tonight, I'm going to overcome. All those terrors of the devil, I overcome. It will be to you according to your confession and according to your faith. And that overcoming spirit, overpowering spirit will be in your life in Jesus' name. Yeah. Psalm 91, I'm reading from verse 5. Psalm 91, we're looking at verse 5. Psalm 91, reading here from verse 5. It says in verse 5, 
Thou shalt not be afraid of the terror by night. I thought somebody there would say amen. Not for the arrow that flies by day. Not for the pestilence that walketh in darkness. Not for the destruction that wasteth at noon day. A thousand shall fall at thy side. And ten thousand at thy right hand. But it shall not come near thee. I'm going to read it in a personal way. I want to get my benefit out of this. If you want, you say it after me. A thousand shall fall at my side. And ten thousand at my right hand. But it shall not come near me. Only with mine eyes shall I behold. And see the reward of the wicked. You overcome their terrors in Jesus name. Isaiah chapter 54. Isaiah chapter 54. And here we're reading from verse 14. Isaiah chapter 54. And we're reading from verse 14. In righteousness shall thou be established. Thou shalt be far from oppression. For thou shalt not fear. And from terror. For it shall not come near thee. Verse 17. Verse 17. No weapon that is formed against thee shall prosper. And every tongue that shall rise against thee in judgment, thou shalt condemn. For this is the heritage of the servants of the Lord. And the righteousness is from me, says the Lord. Amen. Jeremiah chapter 15. Jeremiah chapter 15. Reading from verse 21. And I will deliver thee out of the hand of the wicked. Amen. And I will redeem thee out of the hand of the terrible. Amen. And so we understand. It says, little children, I'm writing to you. What am I writing to you? To give you assurance that your sins are forgiven. To give you assurance that you have known the Father. And it says, young men, I'm writing unto you. Why am I writing to you? Because the word of God abides in you. Why am I writing to you? Because you are strong. Why am I writing to you? Because you have overcome the wicked one. You overcome all his titles. You overcome all his temptations. And you overcome all his terror. We'll come now to point number three. It's uh, in this point number three, the priceless perception of fathers in the faith. The priceless perception of fathers in the faith. We're looking at First John chapter 2. And we're reading from verse 13 and reading from verse 14. It says in verse 13, I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. I write unto you fathers, because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Look at verse 14. I have written unto you. Because ye have known him that is from the beginning. Looks like repetition there. Well, looks like that. But in the first part, I write unto you. In the second part, I have written unto you. And John, what are you saying about fathers in the faith? About the people that have climbed up from little children to young men and then to fathers to the aged in the faith it's same because they have knowledge experiential knowledge they have knowledge empirical knowledge they have knowledge they have experimental knowledge they knew the lord they knew him that is from the beginning is talking about the conviction of knowledge it's talking about the courage of their knowledge. It's talking about the confidence of their knowledge that they know the Father so much because these are fathers in the Lord that nothing moves them. Persecution does not move them. 
And the antagonism of the people of the world will not move them. It says, fathers, I salute your wisdom. Fathers, I salute your courage. Fathers, I salute your confidence. I salute your conviction because you have known him that is from the beginning. They knew him through and through. When it says him that was from the beginning, what does that mean? Proverbs chapter 8. And we're reading from verse 23. Proverbs chapter 8. And we're reading here from verse 23. In verse 23 it says, The Lord possessed me in the beginning of his ways before his works of old. A saying before the foundation of this world. This one from the beginning had been there. And the fathers in the faith, they have known him. Look at Psalm 90. In Psalm 90, we're looking at verse 2. Psalm 90, looking at verse 2. Him that is from the beginning. 90 verse 2. It says, before the mountains were brought forth, and ever thou art formed the earth, and the world, even from the everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Who is the one from the beginning? Well, God the Father from the very beginning. God the Father from the deathless past. God the Father who had always been there, eternal in existence. Who is the one from the beginning? The Lord Jesus Christ, our Lord, our Savior, who had been with the Father eternally. And then John says, you know the Father, you know the Son, you know the God of heaven, and you know him so well that nothing can move you. Let's come to First John chapter 1 verse 1. First John chapter 1. And here we're reading from verse 1. First John chapter 1 verse 1. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, and which we have looked upon, and our hands have handled of the word of life. It's referring to the Lord Jesus Christ. And he's saying, fathers, you have known him. Him that was from the beginning. And he's called him the word of life, the word of God. Because we're told in John, gospel according to St. John. Reading from chapter 1, verse 1. In the beginning was the word. And the word was with God. And the word was God. The same was in the beginning with God. And all things were made by him. And without him was nothing, not anything made that was made. In him was life, and the life was the light of men. Talking about Jesus Christ. And he said, fathers, I'm writing to you. Fathers, I have written to you. Because you have known him. That is from the beginning. What did they know? Number one, they knew the fatherhood of God. They knew the fatherhood of God. And they remembered the words of Jesus. If you've been able not to give good things unto children, how much more shall your father who is in heaven give good things unto those that ask him? And these fathers in the Lord, they were solid and stable and steady in their faith. Anytime they prayed, they had known the father. They knew the fatherhood of God. Not only that, number two, they knew the faithfulness of God. The faithfulness of God is a covenant keeping God. These fathers, they were so settled. Any problem that came, any challenge that came, they were not worried at all. They were not bothered at all. Why? Because they knew the faithfulness of God. And look at uh, that passage we read before. Let's look at that again in 1 Corinthians chapter 10. 1 Corinthians chapter 10, and I'm reading here from verse 13. It says, there is no temptation taking you, um, but such as is common to all men. But God is faithful. God is faithful. This week, you'll find him to be faithful. All the promises of God are yes and amen. And whatever may happen, be like these fathers. They had known the father. They knew the fatherhood of God. They knew the faithfulness of God. Hebrews chapter 10. Hebrews chapter 10. 
And I'm reading here from verse 23. Let us hold fast the profession of our faith without wavering. For he is faithful that promised. He is faithful that promised. And here John said, Fathers, I'm writing to you. I'm writing to you because you know the Father. You know the fatherhood of God. You know the faithfulness of God. You know the, number three, the faultlessness of God. Faultlessness of God. The ways of God are perfect. The promises of God are perfect. And the power of God cannot be faulty. And when he promises you anything, you will find him to be faultless. And John said, you fathers, I'm sure you know this by experience. You fathers, I'm sure you know this empirically. That is, you've tested it. And you have seen it this direction, this direction, this direction, that God has no fault. These fathers, they never question God. Why did this happen? Oh, they say, God has no fault. Why did that happen? They said that God has no fault. They said, when we get to heaven, we will know that all things work together for good to those who are called of God, those who are called according to his purpose. That thing that happened in your life and you're getting confused. Why did this happen? Why did that happen? One thing I can tell you, God has no fault. I said, God has no fault. You will see that he is working everything for your good. This is the lesson that the fathers have learned. That's why John just said, fathers, I'm writing to you. What am I going to write to you? Because you have known him that is from the beginning. And then the following verse again, it says, I'm preaching to you because you know him that is from the beginning. Romans chapter 8, I'm reading from verse 28. Romans chapter 8, verse 28, it says, and we know these are the fathers. And we know these are the growing ones. And we know these are the ones that never question God because they know that they know that they know. And we know that all things work together for good. To them that love God and to them who are the called according to his purpose. The purpose of God will be fulfilled in your life. Yeah. Nothing will come as a shock in your life because you will discover the fatherhood of God, you will discover the faithfulness of God, you'll discover the faultlessness of God. I'm writing to you fathers, why are you writing to them? Because they know the father. What do they know? They know about his fatherhood, they know about his faithfulness, they know about his faultlessness, they knew the fellowship with God. Fellowship with God. That is, there was partnership between them and God. There was friendship between them and God. And there was connection between them and God. Fellowship with God. And that fellowship actually brought a lot of good, good things into their lives. As you read about Moses, God said, I know him face to face. Fellowship with God. And then Moses lived his life as seeing the one that is invisible. Look at Hebrews chapter 11. Hebrews chapter 11, they knew the fellowship with God. Hebrews chapter 11, reading from verse 27, by faith, he forsook Egypt, not fearing the wrath of the king, for he endured as seeing him who is invisible. He lived his life as seeing him who is, in, he was, uh, invisible. He had the faithfulness of God, he had the fellowship with God, and also they knew their future with God. Think about that. These people were not scared about dying. They were not confused about what may happen. What if that came? They knew their future with God. That's why he said, fathers, I'm writing to you. They were so settled in their lives. They were so settled in their conviction. They knew the fatherhood of God. They knew the faithfulness of God. They knew the faultlessness of God. They knew the fellowship with God. And they knew their future in God or their future with God. We're looking at Psalm 73. Psalm 73. We're reading from verse 24 and verse 25. Psalm 73. We're reading here from verse, seven, from verse 24. And verse 25. 
It says, whom have I in heaven but thee? These are the fathers. Whom have I in heaven but thee? And then he goes on to say, and there is none up on, upon the earth that I desire besides thee. That's uh, verse 25. Let me read verse 24. Thou shalt guide me with thy counsel, and afterward receive me into glory. If Jesus Christ lives in your heart, let there be assurance in your heart. In my Father's house, there are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Look up at me here. I'll see you in heaven. Yeah. We'll see one another in heaven. Because I write unto you, little children, your sins are forgiven you. I write unto you, young men, because the word of God abides in you, and ye are strong, and ye have overcome, and you'll keep on overcoming the wicked one. I write unto you, fathers, matured believers, confident believers, faith, faithful believers, I'm writing to you because you have known him that is from the beginning. You know he is your heavenly father. He will not fail you. You know about his faithfulness. His promises will not fail in your life. And you know about his faultlessness. Everything will work for good in your life. You know about his fellowship. And you know about your future with God. He'll guide you in this life. You will not fall. And then afterward, when you close your eyes here on earth, you open your eyes, there you are with him in glory. He will receive you to glory. And therefore you are saying every time, whom, whom have I here on earth? And who do I desire besides thee? He will never fail you. He will never forsake you. We're going to now start making progress in our Christian lives. You are going to grow from faith to faith. From grace to grace. From strength to strength. From power to power. You are an overcomer. You overcome the titles of the wicked one. You overcome the temptations of the wicked one. Hey, somebody there, where are you? You overcome the terror of the wicked one. Stand up, stand up, and be an overcomer. Don't go home, don't go home. Stand up and be an overcomer. You will overcome. Your time of victory has come. Your year of success has come. Your year of growing has come. Have assurance if you confess anything that bothers you to God, he will forgive you. He will cleanse you. He'll protect you. He'll preserve your life. And then as you go through life, you will overcome. Tell the Lord, any temptation there, you are an overcomer. Any trial there, you are an overcomer. Any challenge coming your way, you are an overcomer. Sin might knock at the door, you are an overcomer. Satan might knock at the door, you are an overcomer. Sickness might try to come and see if there is chance for me there. You are an overcomer. Powers of darkness may try to come and wage war against you. Uh -uh. They are coming too late. You are now an overcomer. The word of promise abides in you. The word of power abides in you. And the word of his covenant abides in you. You are an overcomer. From now you know him. That is from the beginning. You know the fatherhood of God. He cannot fail. All his promises are yes and amen. You know the faithfulness of God. He cannot fail. You can stand on that promise and challenge any problem that comes your way. He is faithful. You know the faultlessness of God. There is no fault in Him. You are going to discover sooner or later all things work together for good. For them who are the called of God called according to his purpose you know that fellowship with god you move and live and act as seeing the invisible because of that unbroken fellowship with god 
I write unto you, fathers, because you have known him that is from the beginning. You know your future with God. He will guide you in this life. And then afterward, he will receive you to glory. Let him touch your life tonight. Let him demonstrate his power in your life. I know him. I love him. I trust him. I believe in him. I hold on to him. He cannot fail. He will not fail. Be an overcomer from tonight. You will not be overcome. By sickness, you will not be overcome. By sin, you will not be overcome. By Satan, you will not be overcome. You will be the overcomer. Overcomer. Because you have known him that is from the beginning. In Jesus' name we pray. From tonight, let there be no doubt in your heart that you are an overcomer. In the day, you overcome. In the dream, you overcome. In your place of work, you overcome. Any challenge that may come from anywhere, anytime, you are an overcomer. And you know the fatherhood of God, the faithfulness of God, the faultlessness of God, the fellowship of God, and your future with God. Am I talking to somebody there tonight? Or is she there? Or is she there? Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you because of the truth you have revealed unto us. Oh Lord, we pray that any sin anybody has confessed according to your promise, forgive in Jesus' name. We know the blood of Jesus cleanses us from all sin. And I pray that that cleansing by the blood of the Lamb will be real in every life in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray your people will grow up. And I pray that the word we have had tonight will make everyone strong in Jesus' name. Strong enough to overcome. To overcome Satan. To overcome the devil. To overcome the God of this world. To overcome the prince of the power of the air. And to overcome the adversary. To overcome the accuser of the brethren. To overcome the wicked one that comes to steal and to kill and to destroy. The spirit and the power that overcomes, give to everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray the knowledge of him that is from the beginning. That will know in a very definite experiential manner that our God is our father. Our God is faithful. Our God is faultless. Our God keeps fellowship with us. And in God, our future is certain and bright. I pray that this assurance you give to everyone tonight in Jesus' name. Take all doubts away. Take all weaknesses away. Take all sicknesses away. Destroy the terror of the terrible. Protect your people. From now on, we go from faith to faith. From grace to grace. From strength to strength. From glory to glory. I will pray that when we come back and see one another again, we'll come with songs of joy. I will testimony in every mouth in Jesus' name. Send forth your people with victory and with power. Make everyone victors, overcomers, and conquerors. Confirm the truth in every life. 
We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen.